Good to have you online, we are from Mobile TV. I'm the host to Mobile TV. And today, online, we are uh, We will be talking about new diversity and also about storytelling. Now, online, we are from Mobile TV. We focus on personal development and self improvement topics. Uh, we realize that a personal development and self improvement is a lifelong process that, that we as individuals must embrace in life in order for us to move from where we are to where we need to be. Now, it's a constant effort that we need to put up in order for us to really have a transformed life and also a fulfilling one. Now, all of the innate gifts that, um, that we have within can only come to the fore, be enjoyed and maximized. If we can look in words, right, asking the questions that is needed to be asked, and I guarantee you, the answers we always come forth, come to when we ask the right questions at the right time. Now, this is the mission and the focus of Live Well Live by Mobile Steven, having destructive mindset conversations that is going to move you from where you have to where you need to be. Today's show, I have Thomas Wilson, who is a neighborhood diversity specialist and also a storyteller. Hi, Thomas. Welcome to the show. Well, uh, thank you. I'm so excited to speak to your audience today. Uh, my audience is also excited to have you on the show because you have a unique um, niche. You are covering uh, the neurodiversity uh, community. We like to um, explore more on that. You run a sensory friendly event, um, part of um, your expertise um, for the neurodivergent and also the mental health and other community. Now, I'm sure that there's a passion behind this. Uh, um, Thomas, can you share with my audience? Uh, yeah, I'd be glad to talk about the passion that I have for this work. Uh, would you like me to start with why I do the work? Feel free. Okay. Uh, so I was talking briefly on this before, but I, I always go through this uh, as I talk to people. I grew up in the neurodiverse and mental health community in a time when uh, early 90s, 2000s, when I feel like mental health care was kind of getting bigger People were exploring the world around them, but there was a lot of toxicity and a lot of anger towards the mental health community and those who were in therapy. And as someone in that time, there were a few things that I really noticed was a lot of people don't have access to quality care or events, but also that the general mindset from the community is often that people who have extra needs or whatever phrasing you would like um, is kind of jaded and very limited. Uh, we, as a society, have a lot of systemic attributes in place to actually hold back people with a diagnosis or lived experience with their journey and mental health care. And so as a kid, I spent a lot of my time focusing on trying to hone my own story. As I believe that all people are birthed from stories, it is the foundation, one of the foundations of humanity. We've been telling stories ever since humanity has been around. There have been cave drawings. It focuses on so many different media. But as a kid, I love stories. I connected to Edgar Allan Poe at a very, very young age when I first heard The Raven. And since then, I've loved his work. But I also really, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be someone who shared my stories in a way that helped people because I learned as a young kid, there's a lot of system in place, like systems in place like schools and programs that are supposed to help people that don't work for everyone and they don't honor needs. So as I grew, I continued to work on sharing my story as I know many people are not comfortable, but I wanted to make sure I was a positive force. And as I got older, I continued to rebel against systems that don't work for people because they aren't designed for people. And as I got in, grew older, I've been in healthcare for 10 plus years. I've worked as a reading tutor. I've worked as a mentor and an advocate. But in late 2021, I decided I was at a point in my life where I needed to change. I needed to pursue something that would give my life a new meaning. And I always say that for people with mental health care, it's there is no guarantee that we're going to be good for every single day. There's no guarantee that we're always going to be healthy. It is a daily grind. It is a daily devotion to ourselves to take care of ourselves. And when I was at that point in a low the only thing that really lifted me out of that was the idea of finally becoming my own storyteller, opening my business. And in that moment of revelation and despair and joy, I opened my business. And since then, 
it that was late 2021 it's now 2024 my business has grown exponentially i've been able to help people in 2023 i did about 80 events i'm already on course to break that but everything is rooted in the mentalities that I learned as a kid that there needs to be programs, there needs to be services that actually honor the people who work for them and honor the individual. And that is part of why I do sensory friendly events because so many events in the world, and I'm not trying to bash them at all. There's many great events out there, but they don't honor, they don't always honor the sensory needs, the auditory levels, the amount of people, the way people speak to people and that's really what passion my passion comes from well, thanks for sharing that uh, with my audience uh, thomas uh now since talking about this your passion uh i know that you've had to face some challenges along the way uh can you share that with my audience having to uh embrace this passion and um share it to the larger community to the larger audience how has it been embraced and all the challenges that you've uh, encountered so far yeah so i've i have found that um in general my work has been largely embraced with a resounding joy i've connected with dozens of businesses i've connected with people in the community who are so excited to do the work that i do so excited to receive programs that work for people all the way from age four to 84 or older or younger. But a lot of the challenges that I do face uh, come from people who don't fully understand the idea of sensory work or community members who think that I am running something that ruins the fun for people. I've interacted with people who are very gatekeepy, uh, gatekeeping uh, being the idea that somehow I'm trying to be too PC or too woke, which I I don't like that mentality because all people deserve access. But the other thing that I've also run into that's a challenge, which I'm not letting these stop me, is the mentality that so many people in the community are taught to shame themselves, taught not to seek access to programs and to seek help. And the general reality that there are many people out in the world who have no idea what they can access and how, because so many people have been kept down in so many different ways. Um, one of the things I run into is people are afraid to ask me questions. Um, and I'm actually working on an article now discussing the importance of questions because I find one of the easiest ways to remove someone's power is to stop them from being able to ask questions and get answers. Um, I'm a huge believer that questions are the pathway to power along with education and many people just don't have as much access to that as they should. Thomas, uh, my audience would like to know much about, about the sensory friendly experience. How does it look like? Uh, who are the target audience? So I always say that anyone is welcome to attend my sensory friendly events. Um, but in general, those who often seek sensory friendly events are people who live with um, neurodiversity. And that can be anything from uh, ADHD, autism, and a variety of other things. If you don't know, neurodiversity is essentially a way in which the brain processes and handles information on top of many other things. That answer is a very simplistic one. But the people I often work with want to be respected. They want to be treated well, and they want the noise levels, the amount of people to be handled well. They want open spaces if they're in a building, and a lot of my work focuses on first making sure that I set up that space in a breathable, open manner. So tables are set up well, there's plenty of chairs, there are spaces people can go if they need to get away from the general group. There's quiet spaces dedicated if someone is reaching sensory stimuli overload. But also when people show up, I work diligently to approach each individual with a calm and compassionate manner. I make sure that everyone attending feels respected and heard. Um, I think one of the major issues with like, I always reference concerts and I don't have any problem with concerts. I love concerts, 
but a lot of people can't handle them for very long because they're so loud. There's you know hundreds of that or hundreds to thousands of people, or even tens, and there's a lot of noise. So my work is actually contradicting that mentality and making sure that on top of that respect, on top of honoring that each person is heard, making sure that my tone, my energy level, my understanding of what someone needs always matches the individual. And it can be hard to do that for a large group of people. But luckily, I have the experience that helps me. And I always, always ask that individual what they need and honor their needs. Honoring the needs of an individual is one of the easiest ways to help set up a sensory friendly space and a sensory friendly event. All right. So I would like us to move to neurodiversity, which is um, your core expertise. Um, I understand that you grew up with mental illness and also neurodiversity. Uh, so tell me, what do you think uh, or what do we need to know about this aspect and the challenges that embracing neurodiversity does? So I, I would say there's so much to neurodiversity that it's hard to do it in a short time. But what I always like to encourage, um, there's a few things. One, if you think you're neurodiverse, um, I know that if someone listening thinks they're neurodiverse, it's okay to reach out to a doctor and they feel ashamed, worried, or scared. Um, so one of the other things I really want to focus on is if you are neurodiverse or you think you are, make sure that you are giving yourself grace. Make sure that you're giving yourself room to grow and understand yourself better as neurodiversity is really a complex pattern of way in which the brain works and it functions and really examines the world around us. And, you know, especially if you have someone in your life who is neurodiverse or you're wondering if they are, or you want to gain information, um, I would always advise if you are that family member to give yourself grace as well as this is a complex way in which that individual is always going to live their life. But it doesn't mean that the programs out there are always going to suit them. It doesn't mean they're always going to fail. One of the best ways to handle neurodiversity is to speak with the community, connect with individuals, and make sure you're not alone. I know many people who are afraid to interact with their neurodiversity, and that's part of the reason I do my work is to help people connect to programs that will help them. And the last thing I really want to say about neurodiversity is this is a term that's somewhat newer in our society. And we as people are constantly growing and how we understand it and how we work with it. So if someone tells you something you don't like or you don't get an answer or someone makes fun of you or something else like that, and you're growing and understanding this or studying it, I would always recommend try to understand the human aspects of it. If you're doing research, again, focus on the people, not the outcome. And my expertise is really around the social aspects. So I'm not a scientist, but I know that people's behavior is so often impacted by the supports out there. And yes, this is an overtly complex discussion, but making sure you have the right people and the right supports is going to make everything easier. Not always, but a good chunk of the time. Certainly, Thomas Wilson, uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts on the show. Uh, let's talk about mental out, which is very critical, especially at these troubling times of our life, we can over overemphasize the importance uh, of having this discussion on mental health uh, on a daily basis. So, so what are some of the facts that we are really missing about mental health? I'd like you to share this in your own perspective. So I think one of the core things that I think uh, is, you know, a fact is that there is a lot of misconception in the world right now. And there's a lot of people who are still very worried. Um, I know in the United States, not that long ago, I believe it, we had, you know, men's mental health day and the staggering statistics of the amount of men who are not in care or the amount we also had youth events and other youth months around mental health care. There is a massive amount of people 
Um, I can't quote the exact number right now off my head, but there's so many people too afraid to receive mental health care. And another fact is that receiving care is the best way to treat it. Um, there are so many groups, so many cultures that this is something to push back against. And I don't want to criticize those cultures, but what I want to do is encourage you to seek care um, if you want to know this. And one other thing I really do want to emphasize is just because you don't find the doctor right away that works with you doesn't mean that you can't recover and you can't seek healing. Healing is a continual process. Finding the right doctor is a continual process and caring for yourself is a continual process. I mentioned earlier with my neurodiversity and my mental health that it is a daily devotion to myself and to my well-being that allows me to thrive and sustain. And sometimes that's even a moment by moment thing. And mental health care is it's literally like fighting your brain chemistry in order to take care of yourself. And yes, there are many excellent outside therapies and other things that can help. But I want to encourage you, the main fact about mental health care is you have to care for yourself in each moment and you have to actively participate for it to work. There are many different things I can discuss on medications and other things, but you know, with the well-being aspect of this podcast, I want you to also know that you're not alone. Uh, depression, anxiety, and so many other mental health diagnoses and aspects are very hard to deal with. They make us feel alone. But if there's one thing I can emphasize, you're not alone. There are so many people going alongside this with you, whether or not you see them. Because as we grow as a society, we're learning more and more people have these needs, especially in today's times. So I hope this reaches. Uh, Thomas, do you have any exciting news in the pipeline or any projects you'd like to share with my audience? Uh, yes. So I am uh, currently working on my first uh, Dungeons and Dragons camp that is designed to help youth uh, build self-advocacy skills and problem solving. I'm going to be doing a convention up in March soon, very soon. Um, and I'm constantly working on new things. And I'm also happy to provide my link tree and any other for information people would like. But we have about 20 to 30 new projects happening in the next few months that I'm very excited about. I can't say officially yet, but the camp and a few other th uh, the uh, programs I'm running, as well as a uh, webinar on how active play can help empower the neurodiverse community is also coming up. And all of those things are in my link tree, which I can make sure is listed below. Sure. Thanks uh, for sharing that project with us, Thomas. I wish you best of luck in the project and also in subsequent ones you back upon. So much. All right, uh, Thomas, I'd like to share any parting words with my audience and also your social media handles and your website, if any. Yes, yeah, so my website is RNH Creative Advocacy and Storytelling LLC. Well, RNH Creative Advocacy and Storytelling.net. Um, I run multiple social media at RNH Creative, um, as well as other things. Those are all also low listed on my link tree. And I also have a web a blog, positivity blog called uh, RH Creative Storytelling Circle, which is also listed on that. And my final words on, on this podcast would be, Remember to give yourself grace. Remember to honor yourself and always focus on the fact that while you're not perfect, that doesn't mean you can't be loved as though you are. Thanks for the motivation, Thomas. It's been Laura Lee from Mobile Civic, and I have uh, Thomas Wills, who is a neurodiversity specialist and also a storyteller. She uh, is taught on mental health, neurodiversity, and also about um, sensory friendly events. Uh, it's been worthwhile having you on the show and sharing your thoughts with my audience. I wish you best of luck once again. If you'd like to catch up with any missed episodes of the show, you can do so on any podcast distribution platform. So
any podcasts and cross promotion platforms or community that you bump into online, just search for Live We Are Lived by Omobola TV. And I guarantee you, you're going to have a really transformative uh, mind shift as you listen to experts and professionals share their thoughts uh, and insights on disruptive mind shift conversations on these topics. Till I come your way, I always need you to stay safe. I talk to you soon.